Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. We're continuing on with our series, Jesus Is. And we're looking at some of the aspects and characteristics of who Jesus really is, who he is, and why it matters, why this is important that we understand who Jesus is and what it means to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Peter writes, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to fall on a rock, or causes men to stumble on a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dating back to ancient times, cornerstones were placed at the corners of a building and used as kind of a starting point, a building block, part of the foundation. They put the cornerstone there and they built out from that point. Many times inscribed on them was the date the building was erected or dedicated and sometimes who the builder was or key parties related to the construction of this building. And they're really neat. If you go around Council Bluffs, there are a few that exist in our city. Now, I know if you would go back east, I haven't had that opportunity, but I've seen pictures people have had. And they have a lot older buildings and there are a lot more of these cornerstones that are available to look at. They have them and they look like this. So when it was erected, that was in 1908, I believe, and it was put up, and it was the cornerstone for that building. The buildings had a cornerstone, and they were viewed as significant. When they were put these buildings up, they were erected with the intention of them lasting for generations. Now, somehow or another, we've missed that today. It's a little bit different. Today, um, buildings are often missing the cornerstone. There isn't really a cornerstone. They're built out of stick and steel. And the structures themselves oftentimes are rather simple buildings, utilitarian structures that are put together many times with no intention of them lasting for generations at all. They're here for time, used for their purpose, and then discarded, torn down, and replaced with something else. They've seen their purpose pass away. And while they're there for a while and they mean something at the time because they're used for something, they go away. One look at the city of Council Bluffs, for example, over the past 20 years, say, if you take a 20-year picture and if you were able to go back in time, look 20 years at West Broadway, for example, and just go down Broadway and think about what was there before and what is there currently. For example, High V sits, and it's beautiful, it sits where Omaha Standard and a car wash sat the whole time I was there growing up. It was always there. I remember mom and I going through her 73 Malibu through the car wash. I love that. It was awesome. We'd go through the car wash. I don't know. It was cool to me. We'd go through the car wash and come out. And Omaha Standard was sitting there. I'd drive by and see the big truck bodies they were putting together. And they were there, and it was there forever, but now it's gone. There are cell phone stores and restaurants and other businesses that have sprung up just as others have moved and gone away, and the buildings are gone. I remember going as a PE class to Broadway Bowl. It's just a dirt lot right now. It's gone. Those things have passed away. They didn't last. And when the people built those things, they didn't have any intention of them going away anytime soon, but they don't last forever. They don't stay. There's something that's good, though. The good news is that our Christian lives are a lot different than these kind of buildings, these brick and mortar structures. They're a lot different than that. Christ has made sure that our lives are different than that. We have eternal staying power because of Christ. As we continue on with our series, Jesus Is, we're going to explore another aspect of Jesus and what that means to our life. We learned today from 1 Peter that Jesus has to be the cornerstone of our life. We learned that he is our cornerstone, and we have eternal staying power because of that. Jesus is the cornerstone that we have to build our life upon, our foundation where we need to start everything and go out from there. So 
We're going to be learning a few things from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Three truths that we have to put in mind and keep in mind as we seek to make Jesus our cornerstone. The first one is found in verses 4 through 6 of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. And that is we must put our trust in Jesus. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Peter begins by using this concept of stone and building the cornerstone. This is the same image and the same words that Jesus was using. We're looking back at this. If we look back to Matthew 21, 42, Jesus is talking about being the cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. And at that point, they're reciting Psalm 118, 22. That's where they started at. There's, there's the parallel there. Peter goes a step further by calling Jesus the living stone and by calling us his followers, living stones as well. Peter reminds us in this passage that though we may be rejected by other people, we are precious to God. Though others may put us down, they may reject us, they may cast us aside, they may cast us away, we are precious to God. He cares about us. He loves us deeply. We belong to him. Peter is sharing with us here that God is building us into something. He's making something out of us. He's building us into a spiritual house. And the readers at this time, they understand. They understand what he's talking about here. Regardless of pagan or not, they get where he's going to. And they understand the background. And it's a reference to the temple. And you figure that out especially a little bit more after he goes on later to talk about the priest and the sacrifices. What he is building us into. This idea that we are a temple where God dwells. God dwells in us and works through us. He is in our hearts. His Holy Spirit has made a dwelling place inside of our hearts and our lives. It has to guide and direct us where we go. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Paul talks about this, this whole idea of us being a temple and what that means. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. We're that temple where God dwells. God dwells in us. God's spirit dwells in us like he did in the temple. He dwells inside of our hearts and lives and everything that we do. We are holy and set apart for his purpose. And our lives are now sacrifices to him. And we'll come back to that a little bit later, this whole idea. Jesus Peter describes as akringonius. The, the, it's kind of a big Greek word. It's kind of a weird word. But what he's talking about, the word he's talking about with the cornerstone there, it actually means, you ready for this? The, he is the extreme cornerstone. I looked at that again. I'm like, wow, that's kind of an interesting idea. This idea that he is this, the ultimate cornerstone not just any cornerstone he's not just any old cornerstone he is the extreme the ultimate cornerstone where we build upon and those that trust in him will never be put to shame those that put their trust in God and make him their cornerstone those that trust in Jesus will never be put to shame because he is the extreme the ultimate cornerstone we can put our trust in him and build our lives upon Jesus, the cornerstone. This is what we're called to do. But we have to ask ourselves, when we look at our lives and evaluate how we live and evaluate the things that we do, how we spend our time, are we building our trust and building our lives on Jesus? Is Jesus the cornerstone in our life? Because if we look at our lives, if you looked at us kind of like a building and you looked at us in that way, there are a lot of stones that make us up, right? There are a lot of things that make up who we are as people. You know, we look at what we do for our living, for our job. That's a stone. It's there. It's a part of who we are. And if you look at our family, that's a part of it, who we are. Where we grew up, where we've been, that's a part of us. And all of those things are a part of making up who we are. But the question is, in all of those things that are making up who we are as people, where does Jesus fit in all this? Is he just one of the stones that we just slot in somewhere in the midst of all the others? Is he one of those places we just plug in somewhere 
uh, wherever it fits the best. Or we just kind of squeeze it in there because there's some other things that we'd rather put in the spot where Jesus belongs. We have to ask ourselves, really, truly, honestly, is Jesus the cornerstone, the foundation of my life? Is everything else from that point forward built on him? Do all the things that I do the rest of my life, is all of that built on the fact that Jesus is my Savior? That I love Jesus and I follow him, and he is first and foremost priority. Not anything else, not any of these other stones of my life, but is he the ultimate? Is he the extreme cornerstone? Is he where my life begins and ends? We can place our priorities on a lot of different things. We can build our life on a lot of different things, and people try. You watch this, and I've seen it. People build their lives on their families. Their families, my family is the most important thing to me. And my family is so very important to me. It means more to me than anything except one thing. And that's Jesus. Jesus is first. Jesus is where we need to build our life. Some people build their lives on the job they have. They identify more as what their occupation is than who they are as a believer in Christ. We can't do that either. Because those things pass away. Those aren't permanent things. Sometimes we focus and build our lives on how much money we have or the relationships we have or the things that we, fun things that we get to do. Only when a life is built on Jesus will we have a solid foundation, will we endure, will we last. Because that's where our foundation needs to be. I've got another picture to show you. I'll see if you guys recognize what this is and where it is. Recognize that? So... Leaning Tower of Pisa, of course, and it's located in Italy, and I've never seen it before, but this is an iconic structure, and usually it makes me think of spaghetti and pizza. That's just where my mind goes. But it was also made me think of something else. You see, this iconic structure was the result of a mistake. When they built this structure, I did a little reading about it, the ground on one side of the structure was too soft. And as they begin to build layer after layer after layer, it began to get heavier and it began to lean and tilt. This wasn't built overnight. It took a series of years to build that building. It began to lean and shift and tilt. And this structure at one time was, and I'm not a builder, an architect, or an engineer, but it was leaning as much as 5.5 degrees to the side. So basically off center, I mean, it was, it was a few, several feet off center. When you look at it, you can tell it's leaning the wrong direction. And this is a problem. The foundation was poor. It was unsettled. But this same thing happens to us and can happen to us in our lives at times too. If we don't make Christ our cornerstone and we begin building our life and doing the things that we do, our life becomes sort of out of balance, unsettled, if you will. And for a while, it seems to work, right? Everything seems to look okay. And to the casual observer, you look at it and say, they're doing pretty well for themselves. This makes sense. What they're doing seems like the right thing. But over time, as things happen and things begin to weigh on them, and as more things go on in their lives, they begin to shift. They begin to come out of balance. And it starts to become noticeable, and we see that. And it's kind of discouraging when you think about that, how our lives can do this. But the great part about it is, just like the tower, there's good news for it. There's good news for each and every one of us. Between 1990 and 2001, work began on this tower to stabilize the tower and also to decrease the angle that it leaned at. They decreased it to 3.99 degrees, which I believe they said was somewhere around three feet or so off center. So it was leaning kind of three feet one direction, which is quite a bit still. But they were able to shore it up, stabilize it, and make it safe so it would be ready to be able to see for generations to come. Our lives, when we build them on the wrong things, and become unbalanced, the good news is because of Jesus, they don't have to stay that way. The good news is if our life has become out of balance, if our lives have started to begin to be built on the wrong cornerstone, we can move things around. We can, we can unstack the blocks, start over, put the cornerstone where it needs to be and start again. We have been given that promise. God promises us that he is there with us, and he will help us. He'll be with us there as we continue to build our lives upon them. He's not going to leave us or forsake us because he loves us, because he died for us. He cares about us. And we begin to build once again, and our foundation becomes firm and sturdy, and we can be what God has desired us to be. There's a second, a second lesson we learned from this passage in 1 Peter, verses 7 and 8. 
And that is now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Peter in this section begins by talking about those who do not believe in Jesus. Even though people... Even uh, though people rejected Jesus, he became the cornerstone of God's house. It didn't matter what other people thought. He was still who he was. He was still the cornerstone. Peter points out that people stumbled because they were disobedient to God's message. God, Jesus brought forth a message of what we were supposed to do, how we were supposed to live, love, and follow him. And because they were disobedient or because they chose to reject Jesus, they stumbled. Each of us have this same choice where we're going to build our life. We can choose to build it on Jesus or not. We can decide. We, we decide what we want to do. We can decide, am I going to build my life on Christ or am I not going to build my life on Christ? But here's the thing that we have to understand. You can't do it part way. It's either built on Jesus or it's not built on Jesus. You can't have Jesus kind of. Or kind of not have Jesus. You're either in or you're out. you got to decide. Am I going to build my life on him? Or am I going to build it on some other stuff and just try and slot him in someplace? Where are we building upon? And you see, when we choose to build the wrong way, there's consequences for it. Nobody likes consequences. From the time you're little, you don't like consequences. When you do stuff that mom and dad tell you not to do and you get in trouble, you don't like the consequences. And as it relates to God and his kingdom, there's some consequences for that. We're going to stumble if we choose not to build our life on Christ. And there are many that choose to live by their own rules and their own standards and their own choices. But we find that when we do, it leads to broken hearts, broken lives, relationships, futures, all these things. When we choose to not make Jesus a cornerstone of our life, we're choosing to walk in darkness. When we walk in darkness, we're going to stumble. Turn back with me to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 19. Solomon wrote this, Proverbs 4, 19. So, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. They're stumbling. They're bumping into things because they're walking in darkness. They're not seeing what's going on in their lives. Are we walking with Christ? Are we building our life upon him? Our exception our, our acceptance of rejection of Jesus as the cornerstone and our obedience to him sets the course from here on earth as well as all eternity. We have a choice to make who we're going to follow. Each day, we've got to decide, am I going to continue to follow? Am I going to follow Jesus as I should? Are we going to put Christ first in how we treat our families, our coworkers? Are we going to love our neighbors? Are we going to be people that encourage or are we going to be people that complain? Are we going to invest time in prayer in the study of God's word? We've got to decide. Are we going to do that each and every day? We've got to continue to do that. We want to continue to walk in him so we don't stumble, so we don't have these issues. God is with us and God loves us, and he wants us to build our lives upon him so that we can walk in truth and so we don't stumble. In the 1980s, I became aware of a series of books entitled Choose Your Own Adventure, and I had a few of those books, and I think... In hindsight, I probably got those books because I really wasn't that keen on reading all the other stuff, and they were an easy read. You know, you read them, you could buzz through them in a few minutes because how it worked is this. You get the book, and you start reading, and you get to a spot, and they say, okay, you decide. If you want to do this, go to this page. If you want to do that, go to this page. And so you had the opportunity to pick what you wanted to do, and I kind of like that because when you're a kid, you don't like to make decisions because you don't get to make a lot of your own decisions. So this was one opportunity where you made your own decision. It can choose your own path. And it was a lot of fun. And there were fun books because you got to be the decider in all of this, what you were going to do. The best part about it, though, with the books is it really didn't matter what you chose. You could choose whatever you felt like choosing, and it really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't going to impact your life really one iota. And you could start over if you wanted to and start the book again and pick a different path. If you don't like how it worked out, you just flip back to the spot where, where you made that choice. And then, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go this way. And you could choose and start over again and pick up with the book at that point. And they were a lot of fun. Like I said, because the choices, they didn't really matter. It didn't really matter what we chose to do. And Satan, one of the lies that he tells us is that it doesn't really matter what we choose to do. 
he tells us, you know what? It doesn't really matter. It's really not that big a deal what we're doing. It's not that big of an issue how we choose to live. It doesn't really matter all that much. It's not a big issue. And this isn't true. Peter's reminding us here that it does matter. It matters who we follow, who's our cornerstone. We have to choose Jesus as the cornerstone that we built on for our whole life and everything that we do. There's a third truth that we're taught from Peter, and it's found in verses 9 and 10, and that is we must declare his praises. We must declare his praises. Verses 9 and 10 of 1 Peter 2. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. As followers of Christ, we must declare his praises. Peter goes on to talk about those who believe. And he describes us in like four different ways, who we are. And these things are taken directly, you can find them directly in the Old Testament. Exodus 19.6 and Isaiah 43, 20 and 21, you can see these references and the, the concept and the idea where that came from. First, he says we are a chosen race, and this comes from Isaiah where he describes Israel. Now Peter is describing God's people in this way. We are chosen by God. He goes on second to say we are a royal priesthood. People here, we have to understand that we are in special service to God. We are serving our king. Our lives have to serve our king. We are offering our lives and our hearts as sacrifices to him. Third, he says, we're a holy nation. Like the old nation of Israel, we are a people that are set apart for God's service. God has made us holy through the blood of Jesus. We're holy because of him, and we're set apart to live for him. Finally, he, we are a people belonging to God, and that's rooted with this idea in Isaiah 43, 21, where he talks about the people of Israel being my people whom I have acquired. My people whom I have acquired, Christ has died for us, bought us, and paid the price for us, and acquired us to become his. We are allowed to become his because of Jesus. This is a great gift that he's given to us. And he goes on to say, we have a purpose now. We have a reason to exist, a reason to be, and that purpose is this, that we may declare his praise. That we may declare his praise. That's what we're called to do, is declare the praise of God. Psalm 145 one through seven. David writes this, talking about de declaring praise to God. He said, I will exalt you, my God and King, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will command your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts and they will speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and sing joy joyfully sing of your righteousness. Our lives have to be lived in such a way that they give praise and glory to God. We need to give praise and glory to God in all that we do. When we walk out of this building, when we walk out of the service just to the back, when we're walking through the parking lot, when we get in our car, when we leave this place, we need to make sure that everything we do declares praise to God. Everything we do points back to God, points back to who he is. How we act in all facets of our life points back to God. Does everything we do look like this? When our lives aren't giving praise to God, they're giving praise to something else. Sometimes that's our own agenda, our own desire. Sometimes we begin to direct praise to other people because we want them to like us, right? It's just like when you were a kid in school, you, you start to, to kind of talk to some of, your, some of these people and, and say how great they are because you want them to like you too and be a part of that group. But we have a choice. Who are we gonna give praise to? We need to be giving praise to God. We need to be pointing people to God our Savior, pointing people to Jesus in all that we do. Do our words and our actions reflect the fact that God, His Spirit dwells in us? Are we pointing people to Jesus, how Jesus lived? Are we acting like that and showing people what that looks like and heaping our praise upon Jesus with every facet of our life? 
in the culture we live in, people are quick to heap praise on people. We do. We heap praise on a lot of different people. Last year, people were talking about, because it was the Olympics, and everybody, everybody's into the Olympics when it's the Olympics time, right? I really was. I didn't follow it that close. But everybody loves the Olympics when it's Olympics time. And one of the stories, the big stories, was, of course, the swimmer Michael Phelps, because, because people call him what? They call him the GOAT, right? The greatest of all time. That was the thing they called him. And he was supposed to be the best. And he was touted for all his accolades, all that he'd done. People heaped praise on him over and over again, how great he was. After the Super Bowl, people began to praise Tom Brady for how great he was. He was lucky, by the way. But they heaped praise, <laughs> he heaped praise on him and said how great he was and how awesome he was. And it went on for a little while. Non-athletes get a lot of praise we have people like actresses and actors, somebody such as Angelina Jolie that adopted a whole bunch of kids, which is a great thing. And they have people have heaped praise upon her and said how awesome she is for her love and her generosity. We admire people's greatness at the profession. We admire and praise people for their generosity. And we're quick to do that. We're able to do that. When people are doing things in a public eye, we, we heap praise on them. And we say how great they are. We have to ask ourselves, do we heap the same amount of praise on the one who hung the stars in space? Do we heap the same amount of praise on the one that died on the cross for us? Do we heap that amount of praise on him daily in everything that we do? Do we heap praise on the one that did something nobody else did? He defeated death. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. Do we heap praise on him for that? Our lives must be lived in a constant state of praise to God. And this is a challenging thing to do when we think about how we live and what we do. It's a challenging thing. Do the things that I say, do the things that I do reflect that I'm heaping praise on God? I'm directing everything back to Him, to His goodness, to His glory. Am I honoring Him in everything that I do? But we have to ask ourselves, am I doing that? How I'm treating people, how I'm treating the grocery store clerk, the McDonald's employee that messed my hamburger up three times and I had to go back inside the store three times and I went through the drive through to be faster. Am I reflecting God and how I treat them? Am I reflecting God and how I treat my spouse, my kids, even though I'm tired, it's been a long day? Am I reflecting God in all these facets of my life? Does my life, is my life praise to God in everything that I do? And this is a challenge, and it's something that I haven't figured out yet completely. And I still try to work on every day, because that's what we're called to do, is praise God in, with all that we are. As followers of Jesus, we have to make Jesus our cornerstone of our life, to put our trust in him as lest we stumble. We must make our life a declaration of praise to him in everything that we do. We've come to the point where we have the opportunity to make a decision, to make, accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we would love for you to come forward and just pray with you and encourage you to make that decision to make Jesus the leader of your life, the cornerstone of your life, the foundation where you're building everything upon. Maybe you would like some prayers. It's been a challenge. It's been a struggle. We'd like to pray for you, encourage you, and cheer you on as you seek to make God the cornerstone of your life. Would you come as we sing?